record on this computer. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us October 4th, 2023. Our special guest today is Mr. William Lewis. Uh, we'll, we'll introduce him to you momentarily. Again, this is Lunch Conversations with Randy and Teddy. Again, for those who don't know, I'm Teddy Burris. I'm a LinkedIn strategist, trainer, coach, advisor is my new term. And um, in my business, Burris Consulting, I teach people how to use LinkedIn as a business tool. We do one-on-one -on -one coaching, corporate training. We have uh, you know, uh, programs. We show up in your sales meeting. We do public speaking and workshops across the country, including Mississippi, where I'm heading out to here soon. And uh, Randy will tell you that he has seen me prostatizing the power of using LinkedIn as a business tool, standing on the street corner uh, underneath a lamppost. So um, oh, wow. again, our special guest today is Mr. Uh, 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 Will Lewis. Uh, Randy, uh, I think, are your ducks all in a row, buddy? They are, yeah. I was just having a little trouble finding the old Zoom button. Down. There it is. And I'll just click that and that'll bring me back to where I need to be, I think. So yeah, all set. Stuff, Everything's man. up and running on Facebook and LinkedIn, so I think we're ready to roll for yet another week. Well, Randy Wooden. Intro yeah, introduce yeah. yourself to everybody, buddy. Sure. How do you like my shirt, Teddy? Hey, it's nice. It, uh, uh, did you iron there? that? It looks like nice and crisp. Hey, I take it to the cleaners. You know, I, I put it on the expense uh, account. So well, we, we need to talk about that again, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. we, we can do that. Randy Wooden, I'm the director for Goodwill's Professional Center, Goodwill of Northwest North Carolina, based here in Winston-Salem, and help folks with their job search. As you might expect, that's a lot of what Goodwill does. And the, my, my clients are typically professionals, folks that might be in a, maybe in a salaried role, they have a college education, associates, what have you, or maybe in a leadership role or owned a small company, that kind of a thing. And so we do that. We work by appointment. So I have clients across the, the country, but most of them are right here in our backyard in the Winston area. Happy to help you and find me on LinkedIn. We'll get you on the calendar. Every Wednesday for almost three and a half years now, Teddy and I have gotten together and learned things. And whether it's job hunt related, whether it's business related, it's professional development or just fun topics. And we, we've covered a ton of them. What are we on? Show about 180 or thereabout? One, somewhere around 182, there. Randy. 182. So we've been rocking and rolling. We welcome back Dr. William Lewis. Will Lewis joins us, president of Will House Global. And if you would, Will, why don't you tell us a little bit more about you? And we're going to dive into the topic of DEIB today, three years after George Floyd's murder. And we'll learn about uh, some of the challenges and some of the successes that uh, DEI has uh, witnessed over, over the last few years. So, Will, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background, and then we'll uh, get into it. By the way, before I forget, if you've got comments or questions for Will, put them in the chat. Teddy will keep an eye on them. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, Teddy and Randy, thank you so much for, for inviting me back again. It's always good to have an invitation <laughs> back. We double your pay. So, I mean, it's yeah, absolutely. And no I'm problem. looking forward to the check. I am looking forward to it. It's, hey, it's in you the know mail. <laughs> it's in the my, mail. My background is in higher education, uh, uh, yeah. principally, and then also within the small to business, small size businesses, working in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Teddy, you talked about you, you you had a new name for yourself, strategist. My I used to be refer to myself as a DEI thought leader, but now my I refer to myself as a people and culture thought leader, because at the end of the day, when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, is really talking about people and organizational culture. So I'm a people and culture thought leader uh, here to to help individuals, companies around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Everything that you need as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging is in my wheelhouse. And that's how we got the name wheelhouse within that context. And so I'm just glad to be here. Uh, and, and by the way, also, just before I forget, yeah, I wrote a book called Sweet Potato or Pumpkin Pie, Conversations with My White Friends About Race. I'm not sure if, if the, at, when, when I was on last time, mm -hmm. the book wasn't out yet. And I don't so, think so. No, yeah, I so have it. We talked about it. Yeah, I've, I've got it in in the east wing of my uh, my man cave down down yeah. down hall. Good, good, good deal, good deal. And so yeah, so 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 I have that, and so that's yeah. so we may refer to some of that content. Sure. Uh, in in this conversation, but that's who I am. Born and raised yeah. in Indianapolis, Indiana, and been living here in Winston Salem for about 
eight years now. Yeah, and I, I, I think I got to know you initially. I'm going to think through Sherm. I think you did a, a presentation or two to yes. our, our Winston Salem chapter, and then mm -hmm. got to know you <clears throat> through Leadership Winston, and we've had you on the show. So, uh, welcome back. Uh, yeah. I always ask the why question. I don't know if it was a single occurrence or a series of events that mm -hmm. led you to pursue this as a passion and obviously as your career now. So uh, help us understand your why. Well, you know what? My, yeah. my why actually is not rooted in, in diversity, equity, and inclusion, but is really rooted in social work. I started out in my career as, uh, as, as a social worker. So I got my master's degree in social work and I right. was working in that field for a moment. And then I transitioned into higher education and transitioned into di diversity work. But this is what I found, uh, and I tell people this every day, that ev although I don't practice social work, every although I'm not a practicing social worker, I practice social work every day. Uh, and so as I interact with people, I'm helping people to reach their full potential helping folks that are on the margins of society come closer into the center of society and also helping people to help in organizations to uh, remove any barriers that would prevent people from reaching their full potential. So that mm -hmm. is my why. My, my, yeah. the, the why that I do this work is to help people reach their full potential and to remove barriers so that everybody can be, can be great. Yeah, and we're going to dive into a lot of questions. Some of some of them are maybe a, a bit controversial, and we're going to cover the topics. And Will is 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 has uh, got a, a thin or a thick skin, I should say, and yeah. so he's used to these <laughs> things. But hey, look, you know, I mean, it, it's it's a not an easy topic, and it's something that has really risen to the forefront in in light of George Floyd's murder. But you were involved with DEI prior to Floyd. Yeah. Could you give us a First of all, define what is DEI, and then also let's talk its history, and, and especially before Floyd, because mm -hmm. it didn't just happen after Floyd's murder. Yeah, so, yeah, what yeah. is DEI? How do you, how do we yeah. define DEIB? How do we define that first off? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so, so when we look when you look at it, mm -hmm. we all know the words diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So we know that, but let's just yeah. really kind of really kind of at the base level, foundational level, the word diversity. Is is talks is is re really means everything that describes who I am as an individual, all of my individual demographics, right? So diversity is the and all three of us on this call is diverse. I think one of the, the one of the misunderstanding around mm -hmm. diversity is that people think diversity means you have to be a person of color, uh, you you or, or you don't have or you're not white, no. White people are diverse as well. So diversity is not about race. It's about all of the different demographic dimensions as who, who I am. And that's what diversity is about. Uh, equity, when we hear the word equity, equity is about this whole notion of creating, uh, uh, giving people the tools they need in order to be successful. One of the misunderstandings about equity is that people will say, well, we're going to give somebody something that they don't deserve because we're looking at life through a meritocracy. Equity is not about meritocracy. It's about giving each person the thing they need in order for them to succeed. That's not about giving everybody the same thing, mm -hmm. right? And equity also is about closing yeah. gaps. So looking at any gaps, any gaps of performance, attitudes, uh, experience, and how do we look at the, 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 the standard or the traditional or the or the the norm, and then how do we close those gaps? That's that's equity. Inclusion speaks to us about how do we create an, an opportunity and experience where people can be invited. You're inviting them to the table. You're inviting them to the dance, and you're also inviting them to dance. And so that is inclusion. So it's all about the invitation, being intentional, and including people in the process. Belonging is the outcome. At the end of the day, it's all about creating spaces of belonging where everybody feels a sense of belonging within the organization. You can't get to belonging without diversity, without equity, and without inclusion. And something too to kind of add to that, uh, and I just it's just a thought here. And much like with uh, disparity in in wages, um, it's not necessarily a zero sum game that if 
if you get a little more that I necessarily am losing. Yeah. You follow me on that? I mean, yeah, it, yeah. Is, is that a fair way to kind of look at this thing? So it's, it's not, it's not something you get that comes up off of on my back. It's, it's, it's yeah. not a zero sum game. Yeah. That is, that is a very fair way to think about it. I I, I love that because here's the reality. And, and some of the, some of the folks yeah. on the call or are folks that will listen later. You, you may be aware of an image that has three people uh, on 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 the image, one is a very tall person. One is a shorter oh, yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. One person is in in a wheelchair. Um, their goal is to achieve is to watch a game and and look over a fence to watch the game. You see that the tallest person can see the the game without any assistance. The second tallest person needs some assistance, and the and the third person needs some assistance as well. You give all three people a box. Well, if you give all three people a box, the box really doesn't help the tallest person because they don't need a box to achieve that outcome. The <laughs> second tallest person, in order to achieve the outcome, they need two boxes. And the third person doesn't need a box at all. They need a ramp. And so equity says yeah. that we're going to give people the things they need. So it's not a zero sum game. I'm not taking something from somebody else to give to somebody that doesn't deserve it. I'm giving you what you need in order for you to be successful. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's look at the history of DEI. Is there a point where it sort of became a coined phrase term or help us understand that this didn't start with Floyd? No, no, no. It didn't start with Floyd at, at, at all. To right. be honest with you, when you want to look at, and especially in the workplace, mm -hmm. when you really want to look at this, this history, we have to go back into the 1940s, 1946, 1948, when uh, President Truman desegregated the United States uh, government and also the US military. And so that's where we begin now to see this whole notion around desegregation, uh, because up until that time, our workforce, both in the, at the government level and also in private practice was, was a segregated workforce for the most part across the country. So what, what President Truman did was is uh, through two executive orders, desegregated uh, the workforce. And then that led the way for a lot of desegregation to happen in the in private workforce as well. And when we get to the 1960s, we begin to see uh, this word affirmative action to show up. Uh, when President Kennedy uh, began to look at uh, continuing to desegregate and remove discrimination from the workforce, and so we saw this word called affirmative action, which affirmative action, again, is not giving somebody something that they don't deserve. Affirmative action is saying that we're going to take affirmative measures to redress past discriminations within the current workforce. And so if there is a person or a group of people that are being discriminated, we're going to we're going to put some measures in place to redress that, to fix that, to provide remedy for that. So you saw affirmative action in the 60s and then in the 70s. Uh, when we saw more and more people come into the workforce. Then in the 1980s, we began to see, 80s and latter part of the 90s, we began to see this thing called diversity, uh, really called workplace diversity or managing diversity. And so, so this notion that you had um, more women and, and, and people of color, different people, people with disabilities in the workplace. Not, and not to say that they, they've always been in the workplace. We've Now we're seeing them move out of the menial jobs and move more into the managerial and, and the skilled labor jobs. Uh, and so now we have this word called managing diversity because the whole sentiment was, how do we help people get along with each other in the workplace? Uh, and so, so you had managing the diversity uh, and then and managing diversity, Roosevelt Thomas is, is one of the key folks that kind of really coined that term and he had a book uh, talked about managing diversity in the workplace. So you moved mm -hmm. from managing diversity uh, now into a whole language around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so as you move into the new millennium, uh, we begin to see diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and then that state continues to stay. Now we're beginning to see post-George Floyd, we're seeing uh, just uh, justice, Jedi. People are saying it's justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, we're seeing access. So we're seeing idea, inclusion, diversity, um, and, and, and access. And we're also seeing belonging. 
uh, within the, the language. And I believe that belonging is the is the is the next, and it should have been the first. Yeah. It's the next, yeah. but it should have been the first, if you will. But let me just also provide a little yeah. nuance around George Floyd, because yeah. something else we're seeing in terms of language is anti-racism mm -hmm. uh, language. So people are seeing anti-racism. So be, when George Floyd came, when everything happened with George Floyd, we saw corporations, we saw activists, we saw everybody saying we're going to be an anti-racist place of employment, right? Now, there's been backlash to that particular language uh, three years after George Floyd, and we can talk more about it, but that, that kind of gives you a long view of the history and anti-racism yep. is part of that that language as well. Yeah, thanks. So, and, and, you know, Teddy? Yeah, I was going to say, well, <clears throat> when you uh, when we talk about and see some of the changes that are happening in our societies and our communities and our businesses and schools, et cetera, et cetera, um, I often wonder, you know, we, we, we had this challenge in our mindset that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, first of all, I, I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. uh, as I as I watched uh, my 93 year old uh, grandfather years ago uh, for the last 10 years of his life change and 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 be more of a, more of an accepting and uh, caring person. So that's a whole other conversation. But I saw an old dog change, and and Randy and I are old dogs, and we're changing, you know, in in, in lots of different ways. Look 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 at Randy wearing nice looking shirts. But anyway, <laughs> you know the other thing, you know, you think about how does change happen? And I'm I don't know. You know I'd love to hear your perspective on this. You know, how do people start? You know, changing their ideas and you know, and DEIB, et cetera, et cetera. I I went to a soccer game, a youth soccer. And I saw these little kids running around and I saw different types of engagement through these little kids that I've ever seen through anybody else, you know, and, and I saw all these very diverse children in all kinds of different ways in this, you know, youth group uh, playing, uh, they were playing football, they're playing soccer, they're playing baseball. And I saw how they engaged and it's way different. Mm -hmm. then then i've seen others older people engage and i say share that story real quick to say i think a lot of our growth as a society in deib et cetera, et cetera, is is being i'm going to use a blunt word i don't know if this is the right word or not being pushed upon us by the youth yeah that's that's an interesting uh thought in terms of pushed upon by the youth but i want to go back just for a moment to the notion of change yeah. I think we all have we all have the capacity to change because first of all the things that we have all this stuff we learned we mm -hmm. we've been socialized so we 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 learned some stuff right good or bad and when we were in kindergarten we learned how to say yes and please and thank you and and we learned you know it's polite to to to, to stand in line quietly we learned all of that somewhere I around a lot of that though will just an FYI Say again, what you say, Teddy? I failed at a lot of that, but I've gotten better. Well, He's a well, slow Teddy, learner. This is what I'm going to yeah. say. Yeah. This is what I want to say. So we learned it, but in through life, somewhere along the line, we forgot about it. Yeah, yeah, right. And so, but what? But the message though is that if we learned it, that means we can learn something different. Yeah, right. So this whole notion of of old dogs and new tricks, we can always learn something different. I go back, I just, I'm actually in the process of writing a manuscript right now for my second book. And, and, it, and the book is looking at, at belonging in the workplace. I, I will not share the title yet. I love the title, but I'm not going to share it yet. But, but here's, here's a reference, uh, uh, President uh, Truman, because he, he shows up in the first part of this book and the reason why he shows up is is one because he he did was 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 attributed to the desegregation of the workforce. And so with with his executive orders, we begin to see a snowball effect. However, we have to understand a little bit about his history. Mm. He was born uh, in in right after right after. Uh, uh, the uh, slavery or during during slavery time. His, as a matter of fact, his grandparents owned slaves. His grandparents owned slaves. He grew up in Missouri, 
which it was a slave state and then turned out to be a, a, a state full of segregation. So his socialization was not around creating opportunities for, for black and brown people and, and women to, to uh, get a fair shot in the workplace. That was not his socialization. Sure. Yeah. However, he changed. Now, because I'm not saying that he completely eradicated all of his old thinking, but he changed enough to where he saw the unfairness of, of returning service people who were Black being treated inhumanely and being murdered. Mm -hmm. And he said, there's something that I have to do as president of this country to make a change. Yeah. So that tells me that we can change. And part of his change and part of others who have made changes, it comes from this notion of I've had a personal experience. When I am in proximity with the other, when I connect in with the other and I have a personal experience, then that demystifies, that takes away all the, 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 the myth and we demystify that fake stuff. Yeah. And we now we get to know people for who they are. And now we, be in a, we, we come to know and love this person. Therefore, I'm, it's, it's harder for me to stereotype somebody else because I know that someone in that uh, affinity group I'm connected to and I love. And so now I got to be more of a critical thinker as it relates to to the general population. Yeah, I, I think too, we're especially when you when you look at the various news sources out there. I think we you know we've we've slid into some level of tribalism, <clears throat> where you know we we hang out with our friends and everybody else the enemy, and mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, you know it's not just you know get along with them, it's destroy them. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I mean that's just sad because as I tell Teddy probably a million times, nobody gets out of here alive. You know, nobody nobody gets out of the world alive, and so yeah, we got, exactly. to figure out, got to figure out a way to, to make it all happen. All right, so <clears throat> you mentioned, uh, and we're going to dive into this a little bit more right now, and that is there's uh, there there's a vibe out there, and and maybe you can speak to some of the actual examples of it, of an anti DEI mm. sort of like a pushback, sort of like after yeah. after Floyd, it was I, I won't I hate to use the word it was cool, but it was it was kind of the the thing to do. You talked about you know we don't want to be a racist company. And, and yeah. so it was that, <clears throat> and it was easy to get on that bandwagon because I mean, there was a groundswell of support for it, but yeah. now the crisis is over, so to speak, it's faded from the news somewhat. And so now you're saying there's some anti DEI pushback. So help, help us understand that. Why is that the case evidence of it? And ugh, where do we go from here? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think that that the the pushback happened simultaneously with 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 the the um, progression, if you will, and yeah. and we see this all throughout history, especially when we're talking about the sensitive issue around race in America. And so we we saw the pushback immediately when when we saw the banners of Black Lives Matter. Immediately, we saw all lives matter. There's, that's a pushback. That's a pushback because in the in the instance, what there's what the saying was saying, all Black Lives Matter is that. And I I wish that for me, I would add the two T O O at the end of it. Black Black Lives Matter too. And so so therefore, that's saying that hey, we recognize that everybody's life matter, but it feels as if because of the 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 disparity between police brutality and, and murders of, of, of black and brown people at the hands of police at the time. And still, even today, it feels like that black lives don't matter. So that's why you have the black lives matter. And then the pushback is, well, all people matter. Yes, all people do matter. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we have to do is we have to look at the population that is most impacted by the issues. And, and that's what the whole notion of black lives matter was about. So so you go through the 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 murder of George Floyd, we see Black Lives Matter uh as as a as a rallying cry. We see uh companies saying anti-racism and anti-racism. We see these words talk about this whole notion, the phrase around white privilege, which is is not about economic privilege, it's about racial privilege, but we we see that and then we have our, our some some of our colleagues, some of our, our white folks will say, hey, 
well, I, I, I feel like they're talking about me. You know, they're, they're, you know, they're saying white is bad and, 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 and we're, I'm, and I'm a racist. No, that's, that's not what we're saying. That's not what is, what was being said. And so the, so the pushback comes from this notion of I'm feeling threatened by uh when somebody says anti-racism or somebody says white privilege, I, I feel threatened by that. And therefore, you know, I'm a pushback against it. And we saw that pushback come in the form of several things during that time. And even now we saw critical race theory. Mm. For some reason, there was this whole attack on critical race theory, which I'm not sure why, because critical race theory is a theory, one, and it was something that was taught that is taught in graduate school and not in K through 12. But the the pushback was that critical race theory was being taught. So this whole Black Lives Matter stuff and all the stuff around racism and stuff that we're teaching our kids mm -hmm. in kindergarten to hate white people, to hate America. And, and so that's a pushback against the, the affirmation that Black lives matter and we need to pay attention to that. So I don't want to pay attention to it. So therefore I'm going to put something else out there that distracts us. Yeah. So, so you had the, you had this whole notion that um, uh, critical race theory was being taught in, in K through 12, which the critical race theory itself was not U.S. history uh, and, and perhaps uh, African-American history was being taught in K through 12, but not the critical race theory is that that is too that's a concept that kindergartners and even juniors in high school can't even get around that's a concept that you have to come up further within your education then we then we began to move from critical race theory into at the time president trump not not making a political statement just making a statement of fact uh there was an executive order that outlawed uh diversity equity and inclusion at the federal government level uh, and we saw that as part of a pushback, if you will. Uh, simultaneously, you began to see states to, that had outlawing critical race theory. You saw mm -hmm. uh, DEI being outlawed, uh, training being outlawed at the federal government level. Uh, and then we also saw uh, the the whole uh, 2000 and, and the, the 21, 2021, January 6th, that in many ways, that insurrection, and it was an insurrection, people went against our federal government, that insurrection in many ways was part of a pushback as well. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we move in from 2021, coming in 22 to 23, we see state legislation uh, that is outlawing diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, at the higher education level, saying that they're going to remove the offices of DEI officers, the offices, and also mandatory training, continue with the pushback. Uh, and then we see the Supreme Court decision that uh, has outlawed race consciousness uh, in the admissions, allowing race in the admissions process in, in higher education. So there's a lot of pushback that's happening both nationally and also locally around diversity, equity, and inclusion. One of the um, um, one of the things that I I use this phrase. We all use this phrase, and that is I don't understand. We all use that phrase lots of times. When I say that phrase to myself, what I've conditioned myself on, I'm not necessarily uberly successful at this, is to stop and ask myself, why don't I understand? Because mm, um, often what people will say, I don't understand. And then in lots of topics, we'll bring up the barrier. Well, lots of topics will bring up, well, it can't be right and whatever. Instead of stopping and asking myself, why don't I understand? And what do yeah. I not understand about it that maybe I should understand? Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, Teddy, Absolutely. we're halfway through. If you want to do the halfway break yeah. and then we'll we'll uh, yeah. carry on. Yeah. And uh, Dan says, being ignorant is not a crime. Choosing to stay that way m maybe is. So, um, hey, I, we're on Lunch Conversations with uh, Randy and Teddy. Um, our special guest today is Dr. William Lewis. The conversation is about, you know, DEIB and, uh, you know, how our, our communities, our societies are changing uh, as an impact of these ideas and, and, and actions and philosophies uh, post-George Floyd. 
and um, and um, it's it's a it's a big conversation. It's a conversation that uh, I doubt will ever go away. But as I told Will earlier and uh, before the show started, I gotta hope that in time we start uh, becoming a better society because we stop and ask the question. Why don't I understand? So back yeah. at you, Randy. As, as I'll tell I, you what, as I prosthetized a little bit there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, and we have a lot of talking points to, that we can cover. We could talk for hours on this thing, but I want to try to make yeah. sure we work in as much of this as we can. So, what's the temperature check from your perspective on companies and their uh, appetite for continuing to uh, move forward in the DEI space? Uh, or is it kind of cooled off and sort of like, well, we're on to the next? you know, the next yeah. box to check. You know what? I think companies are, I think that we're, there's not a, I, I don't think for the most part, especially with my clients anyway, there's there's not yeah. an, oh, let's, we check this box and we're to move on. But I will say this. We are seeing somewhat of a retrenchment from our big big box companies. So, so even before George Floyd, we had a lot of our major companies were doing diversity, equity, and inclusion, Right. Now, but what we're yeah. seeing, though, is after George Floyd, we saw this explosion of professionals being hired into companies all across different industries around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're now we're beginning to see those people being laid off uh, for whatever reason. Uh, so you're, th those, those positions are being kind of tracked back, if you will, walked back, if you will. Uh, we saw, remember, we saw a lot of, lot of companies saying, hey, we're an anti-racist company and we're going to make this commitment. I haven't heard anything about their commitment to anti-racism, right, after, after three years. Not to say that they're not doing it, it's just now that it's not as public. So you make a public statement, but you're not now, you're not necessarily communicating publicly as to what you're doing uh, related to that public statement. So I believe that Companies are searching. Uh, they're 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 now kind of searching for uh, what what how do they uh, continue to create this sense of, of of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and now belonging in their workplaces because mm -hmm. the what's happening around the states, the different states, and and in our red states, principally around state legislature banning diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's caused, causing a chilling effect across all, all the country and, and different states. One of my clients had, had asked me, they said, well, Will, you know, we're, we're doing our diversity plan. And should we even talk about diversity um, on, in, on proof? Should we put it on our website? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yes, you, you have to make that. You have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. You have to have a declar declarative decision. This is our value and this is what we're going to do. So companies are now are being. It's like in, in in sports. I was watching a football game over over last weekend. The kicker gets up, gets ready to kick, and and the opposing coach blows the whistle. Uh, they blow the whistle to kind of chill the the kicker off, to cool the kicker off, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what just happened. The whistle has been blown uh, with with this anti DEI legislation, and so now co companies are figuring, trying to they they're like, oh, it's a chilling effect. What do I do? I, companies are still moving forward, but now they're moving forward more cautiously. But I will, I will, I will say this. Yeah, I believe that what we're experiencing is a good thing for the industry. It's a good thing for DEI because sometimes we do need to take a step back, reassess, and and ask ourselves the question: Are we the efforts that we're doing inside of our companies, inside of our schools, inside of our communities? Are they reaching the outcomes that we hope to achieve? Mm -hmm. And take that assessment. And then if they're not, that's okay. We can uh, pivot mm -hmm. and do something that does help us reach the outcome we want to achieve within that framework of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because at the end of the day, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, they're not about people. I mean, I'm sorry, they're not about programs. Yeah. They're not about processes. They're about people. So how do we create the space where people can reach their full potential? That was uh, next. My next question for you deals with belonging. You just mentioned that, and and why why do you feel like that's important in the workplace? Belonging. You know, one of the things about belonging, belonging. If you look at Maslow's hierarchy mm -hmm. of needs, right? 
on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you 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 have these these needs that everybody has to have to have before they get to self actualization. On there, we don't see diversity, we don't see equity, we don't see inclusion, but we see belonging. Hmm. Belonging, it, when you look at it, it you have the, the the physiological needs, you have safety needs, then you have belonging, uh, then you have respect, then at the top you have self actualization. For everybody that's listening to this call now, everybody on this call now, belonging is a is a fundamental need that everybody needs. No matter your perspective, no matter your politics, no matter your race, your gender, your sexual orientation, none of that stuff matters as it relates to belonging because each of us as human beings, we need to feel a sense of belonging. And when we feel a sense of belonging, if it's in our families, if it's in our, our, our synagogues, if it's in our workplaces, our communities, we tend to give more of ourselves and our, our, our productivity increases when we feel like we have a sense of belonging. So from the workplace perspective, mm -hmm. belonging is the key because that unlocks my commitment and my potential, and more importantly, my desire to, to go above and beyond for, this, for, this, the, for the people that I work with and the company that I work for. Yeah, you're, you're invested. So another, another follow-up here on this thing, and, and that is as far as tools that leaders and supervisors would need to help advance the DEIB initiative within their company. What are some typical uh, tools and, and knowledge yeah. chunks or what have you that, that you, you impart to help these guys move that ball forward? The first tool is, yeah. is what I call this is not training, but it's professional development. We, we, we look at the, what I try to do is, is invite leaders, those mm -hmm. people who are the C-suite leaders and then also the supervisors. We have to look at and, and, and look at our mindsets. There are several shifts that we have to look at. One shift is a mindset shift. How do I see this? How do I sit down? Because everything that, that comes to fruition happens in our minds. And so our, our mind is a, is a powerful thing. And so how I see it, how I see race, how I see meritocracy, how I see diversity, how I see people with disabilities will impact how I react and respond to them, right? And so we have to look at first our mental capacity, our mindsets. Then once we look at our mindsets, then we look at what I call language. What's the language that I'm using? Because usually when my mindset has shifted, I, I'm using using language that supports that shifted mindset. Then once I look mm -hmm. at the language, now I'm going to begin to apply my behavior, uh, my be my my behavior shifts, my relationship shifts, and so what. So the tools are helping people in a in a in a mindset shift experience. So take them through some capacity building, professional development to help them become more self aware, uh, mm -hmm. to to support their mindsets and change their mindsets. Also, we have to look at the organizational culture. Training does not solve the problem. The problem really is, is lies within the organizational culture. So what is, what is my culture? How does my culture impact my behavior? Uh, then we also have to look at assessment. A lot of people want to move to how do oh, I got to assess this? I, oh, well, I got I to gotta train on this and mm -hmm. I'm going to do this type of activity. I say, nope, let's assess the organization. Let's get some data. Let's, get, let's see where the pain points are. And then we will dedicate our resources to those pain points. So, so, so Randy is not necessarily something to where, okay, I'm going I'm to bring out a screwdriver for this and a hammer for that. It's more or less saying, okay, let's look at this from the big picture. What is the mindset that I'm coming with? What is the language? And then let's look at the organization and now let's evaluate that organization. Then we put programs and policies and training in place after we've done that other stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, Will, you um, uh, you touched on this, our, our mindset is important. <clears throat> and then, you know, then you, you you hit on this other topic and that is our our words are important. And my, my, my wife is a, a, a preschool teacher, um, uh, early childhood education, uh, coaching children with disabilities. And I'm trying to use the exact, the right word because I remember uh, when I was talking about children 
uh, on the autism spectrum, I would say an autistic child. So I put the disease or the challenge or the issue yeah. in front of the human. Mm -hmm. and my wife, I swear, if she swing a frying pan. You you listen to that woman, and mm -hmm. she kept she kept encouraging me and got me to understand the importance of put the child first. Yeah. It's it's a child on the autism spectrum. It's a child who has uh you know ADHD. It's 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 the child. And and when we when we when we use the right words. I had the mindset that I care about, you know, helping these children. I, I care about, you know, and excited about my wife being involved in, in helping them grow, but I was referring to it the wrong way. And so that would, my words were wrong and that would impact a lot of times how people felt about what I was talking about. And a lot of times my own, my own feelings about what I was talking about, because I said no, it wrong. No Teddy, you're absolutely right. My wife is in the same area. She works with with. Uh, she have a frying pan. Well, you see, she, yes, she, she has a frying pan as well. So I, 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 I'm ducking all the time from from the frying yeah. pan. Uh, but but the notion of is, and she shares with me, it's it's all about people centered, people first language. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so it's people with this. It's because it's the people with this, right? And so so <laughs> how do we? continue to think about people first in our language yeah all right so here's uh here's here's one that i'll oh golly i was going to compare it to something else now i forgot what it was i was going to compare it to oh yeah social media let's back up about 15 years yeah and you're going to walk into a C cfo's office and say yeah we need a social media uh marketing person in our company now, i can tell you how that went randy <laughs> And they're going to go, oh, heck no. That's playtime. That's not making us money. Yeah. Yeah. And now keep that thought in place. Mm -hmm. Now, fast yeah. forward to today, and obviously it's a different, different setting. Same thing with, and I'll look, maybe not a great analogy, but compare it to the DEI situation. Oh, that sounds great. Jay, we're, we're all about DEI, mm -hmm. but um, how's it going to make us money? And yeah. and so help us understand the value proposition for DEI yeah. and yeah. and how that's measured. Now, how do we know if we're really doing a good job? If it's attributable to DEI, or is it attributable to other factors? And that's a big big question when you start uh, when you start talking about dollars being kicked around. So help yeah. us unpack that, Will. Uh, that's a that's a that's a lot to unpack, right? So let's start here. Let's <laughs> let's first. <laughs> What I tell people yeah. when you want to when you want to find out if the needle's moving, mm -hmm. the first thing we have to do is we have to understand what our baseline is. Mm -hmm. And so if we're if we're asking yeah. a question around recruitment around certain groups or retaining certain groups, or if we're looking at pay or if we're looking at the overall experience, the first thing we have to do is do an assessment. The assessment gives us a baseline. And then from then, then I'm gonna look at this from a social work model and a medical model. That is, mm -hmm. you identify, you assess to identify the problem, you put a solution in place, and then after the solution has worked its way through, then you reassess. Right? Then that helps us to understand if that particular solution we put in place impacted that particular problem. So to, 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 to respond to that question, we got to get a baseline, do assessment, get a baseline, understand where the pain points are, then put some programming processes, uh, uh, training, whatever it is to address that particular gap problem. Then we reassess to see if that went away. So when I was at Virginia Tech, I remember when we did a, uh, mm -hmm. a, a survey uh, for, for staff. And one of the things that came out of the survey was that uh, communication was something that needed to be improved across the university. And, and, and very specifically, they were like, you know, senior leaders are not communicating and it's inconsistent. So you, you the assessment identified the problem, communication. So then yeah. the university leaders put together an intervention to address the problem. So they had all types of re new communication process, protocols, policies. Then when they assessed again, did another survey with communication being on there, guess what? 
you began to see that 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 where the communication gap was like this, you began to see it close because people now are aware and and they see the the strategies in place. So that so to get to, hey, this is a this is a dollars and cents, and how do we make sure that we're investing uh, our money in the right places? You have to do the assessment. And then from the assessment, that'll tell you where you go. So to answer your question, Teddy uh, or Randy, you know, it's it's hard to say, oh my goodness, you know, you're gonna save this amount of money on diversity, equity, and inclusion because it's very nuanced. You know, I'm gonna ask you, what are your problems? Yes. And then you know, less I mm-hmm. well, I'll um uh, I, I, rem- I remember some conversations with uh, organizations who said our problem is communications. And and I'd hear, love to hear your perspective on this. The problem isn't communications. The problem is what's happening as a result of poor communications, you know? And and so, yeah, communic- they wanted to improve their communications because it, there was a bigger problem going on, whatever that bigger problem was. And and there's and with you know with DEI uh, uh, initiatives and philosophies and ideas and actions and training and all that stuff, the problem isn't you're trying to create a more diverse, uh, equitable and, uh, and and inclusive and belonging community. That's not the problem. The problem is your people are walking. The problem is you're not hiring the right people. The problem yeah. is your productivity is low. The problem is your employees are not happy. Well. Yeah. This whole these whole initiatives of DEI, et cetera, et cetera, are focused on the problem. And so by by improving relationships in the workforce, by improving the uh, the way people will get along and by creating happiness and you et cetera, et cetera. And I'm simplifying yeah. this because I'm a simple man, dude. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You again, you improve retention, you improve recruiting, yeah. you improve productivity. And by the way, Anybody in business who doesn't call that dollars is not paying attention. Right. Absolutely. Not only are you improving that, but you're also, you're, you, when you improve retention, when you improve how people engage with each other, guess what you're not, guess what you're also doing? You're mm-hmm. mitigating your chances of having lawsuits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're also having a positive impact on your community. Yes. And for those of us who are in business who care about that, which, by the way, I believe is a fair number of business owners out there care about that. Mm -hmm. That is uh, there's a word, there's a term for it, you know, community involvement, community engagement. Mm -hmm. And and that also pays dividends. Yeah. 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 And so 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 the 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 when you when you engage and, and when you look at diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging, I would say look at it from a change management perspective. Because if you look at it from a program, then yes, you're gonna say, oh, that program didn't reach its mark. We're gonna we're gonna do away with it. Mm. No, we're looking at how do we change the organizational culture. When the organizational culture changes, people stay, and people want to come work for you, and you have more customers, and people are giving their 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 they're going above and beyond to reach the goals that you have for them in the organization. So it's a change management program, process rather, and not a program. Yeah, I'm not at liberty to tell you the name of the company or the organization, but you know the saying that people don't quit a job, they quit a manager? Mm -hmm. I could write that book. Yeah. Yeah. Because I did, because he would not change. He was uh, was about as racist and ignorant as you can be. And I gave him three chances. And the third time I walked into his office, I was telling him goodbye. Yep. Yep. Hey, no longer is it just okay for a company to have a good product at a good price and have decent service. I mean, it's no. and just show up for work and trade your time for for money and go home. Um, no, it's uh, you know those were days gone by. Now, I guess yeah, some companies still might practice that, but then they're going to run into that attrition and turnover probably more than than other companies would. Uh, we've got still uh, about ten minutes left. Got a couple other. And uh, by the way, Randy, to, to throw uh, out there what you got. By the way, those those companies will show up on a John Hyman report on LinkedIn. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, do a LinkedIn search for John Hyman. It's a uh, uh, with a Y H Y M A N. You'll you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, read it. Read it every day. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big world, and there there are a lot of goofballs out there. I'll tell you. Uh, all right, so um, so. It, 
I'll uh, I'll use a, a term because I'm an older recruiter. Back in the day, there was an ISO 9000 quality certification that companies could have, and and when they would attain that, that opened the door for additional um, business. We'll just put it that way. And there's not necessarily a, I guess, a DEI certification. Is that something maybe that's coming down the pike? Is there some kind of a, a common metrics or things that are in the works to say, hey, we have achieved, I don't know, the bronze level or the silver or the gold? Or it, is there a way to measure to say, hey, we're really doing well with this yeah. by yeah. comparing maybe to other companies or you help us understand a little bit more about that? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? It, interesting yeah. enough. Um, I think that so you have you have some certifications. So for individuals, so if an individual mm-hmm. wants to uh, go deeper into their, if if you if you work in the DEI space, you can get a certification. Uh, several several higher education places and some non and some for co- for profit places yeah. offer certifications mm-hmm. in DEI. Uh, I actually do a training for supervisors uh, and leaders, and it's not a certification, but you get a certificate. Uh, takes you through six sessions to understanding this whole mindset that I talked about, understanding the organizational culture. So it kind of takes you deeper as a supervisor. As a company, companies, I've not seen a company that that receives a certification, but I, I've seen companies that receive awards. As a matter of fact, the Triad <laughs> Business Journal, uh, they they offer uh, diverse, they, they offer awards to individuals and companies who are advancing diversity. Uh, here with within the region, and so so if you, you they have a metric that they look at, and you you self report what you're doing, uh, then they will look at what you reported based on their metrics, and also will call you to verify and ask some some of your clients to verify, and then they look at you based on some industry standards, and then from there um, you'll you'll qualify to get their their award. And so there are a lot of awards out there for companies in which that is that is very good because everybody needs to have a pat on the back. Everybody needs to say, hey, mm-hmm. you do, you're doing a great job, right? Uh, but in terms of from a company level, I've not seen any kind of certification from a company level or mm-hmm. any, uh, <laughs> if you're a part of a trade organization, if your company is part of a trade organization, that trade organization may have some type of standard or, or some type of uh, award, if you will. I know in higher education, when when each institution gets accredited, they have an accrediting body that comes in and said, and, and diversity, equity, and inclusion is a part of that accrediting process, uh, but it's not the sole thing. And so I don't think that there's anything right now yeah. that looks at the organization. It's a, it's a, sounds like it's a more of a continuous improvement. It's a it's an ongoing process. You know, we're not, we're not necessarily there because there's always going to be turnover and new yeah. people. And, and, you know, to Teddy's point, people quit their boss yeah. uh, as yeah. much as anything because yeah. the boss uh, has a big impact on the, the immediate culture that you deal with. Yeah. Um, hey, by the way, before I forget, what's that in the background? Those, uh, <laughs> well, wait, wait, wait. Cr- Christy what? was the first person in the audience she was. to ask what that's yeah. all about. Yeah. You, you know what, Christy, like I, I always look for something fun, right? And so this is this is Kermit, and it is it is uh see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Uh and so that's that's what the background is 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 there. And so so you know, I'm I'm trying my best to to live out that that particular credo. I'm not sure if I achieve it all the time, but there it is. Uh so that's the background. Randy, let me let me share with let me just share another thought in terms of yep. your question related to mm-hmm. certification. Yep. So one of the things that that I've done uh is identify, and you have other companies that do this as well, is to help organizations understand their maturity models. Not a certification, but through the evaluation process, through the assessment process, we have a Likert score, we have a, a number, so the top is five. And and we can we can measure your organization by how you respond to our survey to say that you are an emerging organization, you're you're developing or you're transforming. And the goal is always to get to transforming. And so it's not a certification, but it is a maturity model that says how mature you are as an organization related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And so I think that is that is that is something for organizations to to thrive, to to strive for is to always increase and always learn and get better on that continuum. 
Got gotcha. you. So we're we're gonna wrap up here in a minute, but uh, will I offer one of the things that uh, I, again, and one of my philosophies is it's great to be compared to others. It's better to compare myself to my yesterday. That's right. Hey Teddy, uh, if you would, would you uh, put the link to Will's book in the chat? If, if I you did, have dude. I is did. It I think okay. you did. I saw that. Yeah. Okay. Hey, dude, I, Randy, no. I, Randy, I'm doing my job, man. <laughs> I'm doing my job, buddy. <laughs> Hey, real quick, uh, Teddy has a crystal ball stashed away there somewhere. So, Will, uh, I know you don't have a physical crystal ball there, but if you do uh, want to take a dive in the future glimpse uh, arena, uh, where's yeah. DEI headed in the next? Yeah. Pick pick a time frame, year. Yeah. Yeah. Two I'm years, whatever. My head, I was going right to so go there, but I, I, you know, <laughs> we see the same barber. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but but here, here's the thing yeah. I think in the future, First of all, diversity, equity, and inclusion, belonging, it's not going anywhere. That's that's the reality. So whoever is saying, oh, it's, can't wait to, it's not going anywhere. It's part, it's part of who we are. It's, it's dealing, we're dealing with people. And every and, and when you work with people, you're going to work with individual diversity and group diversity when you work with people. So you can't get away from it. It's yeah. not going anywhere. I think that in my mind, belonging is going to, that's going to surface up to the top more so than what we see now. And we have to just be sure that when it surfaces that we don't forget about the gaps that we see in our organizations. People have their, their equity gaps around people, performance and experiences. And so uh, as we move into belonging, uh, I say that we need to also keep in front and center the gaps that people may experience. So for the future, for me, it's, it's, it's all about belonging. Yeah. Hey, uh, you've got a speaking engagement coming up. Want to get a plug in for that? I love it. Absolutely. October 16th, October 16th from 1.30 to 2.30, we're doing a Zoom call for supervisors, naming the five shifts that every supervisor needs to have October uh, 16th, Send me, a, send me an email, william at wtlewis.com. I'll send you all the information. And stay and connect with me on LinkedIn, and you'll also see the information on LinkedIn as well. October Got it. 16th. Got it. So uh, we've we've covered pretty much everything that we had on the on the list. Teddy, anything else in the chat real quick that you need um, to mention? No, no, no man. Not so we, much? Um, um, a fairly quiet day. Um, so... Um, uh, good deal. Yeah, I think we I think we hit all the good stuff. Okay. Man. Yeah, well, thank, thank thanks you. for uh, thanks for stopping in. This is a, you're a repeat yeah. offender. You were on here a couple of years ago, and yeah, uh, I enjoy it. Yeah, Randy, so, we don't it, call them offenders, dude. We I've told you this numerous times. <laughs> alumni? Is it alumni? Alum what do we go? Call, call them alumni. I do, I do alumni. Look at you Absolutely. getting better. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but it's uh, it you know, it's a topic that is uneasy for some, uh, and for others. It, not not so much, but I think with a lot of things in life, it, as I say often, we don't know what we don't know, and as yeah. we know more, we can do better, and and it, and as we have more information, we can make better decisions. So this is just part Absolutely. of that mosaic as as yeah. we go through life. So, will uh, Doctor Will Lewis, William T. Lewis, uh, yeah. Yeah. President yeah. Will House Global, thanks for joining us, and Teddy. Next yeah. week Thank is you. Marissa right. Michael. Yeah, Will, thanks a lot for coming on again. Yeah, Randy, thank you, it. Randy, so, uh, thank you. Appreciate uh, you. Yeah. So Marissa Michaels joining us yep. next week. Next, uh, Marissa is the Vice President of Employer Solutions at Novant Health. And this is a brand new conversation, a brand mm -hmm. new idea. Novant Health is one of the medical in, uh, uh, institutions that are working yep. to bring healthcare to the workspace. Uh, really a cool initiative and I uh, look forward to Marissa Michaels being on the show next Wednesday. That would be do the math, Randy, October 11th, 11th, 55 AM. Will, we appreciate you to our audience. Thank we you. appreciate you being here. We'll see everybody next week. Take care. All right. Have a good Thank one. you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Will. Yep. Thank you.